Stand with me. Let's read the text together as we do each and every week, giving reverence to God, knowing that when we read the Bible, God is speaking to us. Let's begin in verse 18 of Ephesians 1. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is God's word to us. You may be seated. And as you sit, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Father, we need your help. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I want to be a faithful servant to my brothers and sisters here in the next 40 minutes or so, would you please teach us and fix our eyes on Jesus, enable us to bring glory to him, make his name known, make him famous in our eyes. No matter what we're going through, please quiet the noise of the outside and stir something within us on the inside to love him all the more and to see his greatness and to trust in your power. In our weakness, be our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Having a revelation of God's power and God's character will really change your life. How many of you can recall a moment in your life where you're going through something and a revelation or a greater understanding of who God is puts everything else into perspective? We talked about this a little bit last time, but you know, you go through a trial and when you have a revelation, an understanding of His sovereignty through the revelation of His Word, suddenly you're able to make it through. You can trust Him. You can be calm in the midst of a trial or a storm. When you have questions or frustrations with the way the world is, you look at His mercy, His justice, His love, His truth, His goodness, and you can see God's attributes. You place those on top of your situation, if you will, and you look through the filter of who He is at your circumstance, how many understand that puts a lot of things in perspective? It saves lives. People will be changed forever. No longer insecure, no longer anxious, no longer confused. I think of one situation, even a man who wanted to commit suicide. We once got a message into the ministry, and this young man was preparing that night to commit suicide. And he went on YouTube and started watching various videos, and before he knew it, An understanding of who God is, the gospel, the hope, the comfort of Christ washed over his heart and mind. He didn't want to take his own life any longer, and it was the character of God that gave him assurance. He felt hope. He felt like living, and he felt like he had found God. And I remember thinking, well, of course, you feel like you found God, and really what was happening in the heavenlies is God was, like John 10, seeking out another one of his lost sheep and drawing them home. And he did that through an understanding of the gospel and his character. This is not an uncommon story. Your story, my story, many of us experience throughout our lives these moments in which an understanding of who God is changes our life and our situation. Lots of churches are seeing that. Many ministries are seeing that. The truth is that not everyone does experience that, though. The question begs, well, one person experiences that, but some people don't care. They could hear the same sermon about the character of God. They could hear this sermon on the greatness of who He is and His power And it's like water rolling right off a duck's back. What's the difference? Well, one heart has been enlightened to who God is. And that's what Paul's prayer is for the church. He's praying that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. Why? Well, because then they would see with eyes that are rooted in the Word. They would see eternal things. And the earthly things would begin to fade, and they would have hope, and they would have peace. They would see the riches of His inheritance, the hope of His calling, and the greatness of His power. 
I want to unpack those three particular things that Paul wants them to see. And then I want to finish this whole message with a big question. Kind of the so what, now what idea. You're going to understand the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance, and the greatness of his power. And then I want to ask us, so what does his power mean for us? And give you some practical truths to finish. But let's look at it first. The hope of his calling. Paul says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of his calling. The word hope there means to look forward to something with confidence. He wants them to see what's in store for them because of God's call. You could picture Paul saying this, if you could just see what is in store for you, if you could see the attention and the intentionality that God has placed on you in his effectual calling on your life, you wouldn't give up quickly, you wouldn't be filled with despair, you would be filled with hope. And that hope is in his calling. If you're one of those people that likes to circle words in your Bible or mark up the margins, I would emphasize that particular word, his. It's his calling. It's not something they found within themselves. It's not some sort of self-help or or motivation. They they work themselves up to feel enough hope. Their hope is in God's calling. They didn't call themselves, choose themselves, or find it in themselves, and that word calling is a word describing special privilege or favor. That gives them hope because they realize that God has given them a special attention. He's poured out favor and privilege upon them. And for the Ephesians at that time receiving this letter, this would have cast a wave of optimism over their soul. They would have been discouraged constantly because of the culture that they lived in, much like you and I experience discouragement in this life because of the world around us. But one day, we know, because of the hope of our calling, that when this life is over and we stand before God in judgment, that we are saved and we are secure, that we have special favor with Him. And so you're not waiting for the fires of hell to find you. He's not going to crush you and grind you down into dust. No, you're one of His. And so no matter what this life throws at you, what you have coming in eternity is far greater. You will experience none of the antonyms for hope. You will not experience on that day pessimism, cynicism, skepticism, gloom, despair, disbelief, fear, hopelessness, or dreariness. And might I challenge you today that you should not be feeling those things regularly in your life here on earth if you're a believer, not because you can't have feelings, not because nobody experiences that in various seasons, but as a regular way of life. If you are a dreary Christian, you have forgotten the hope of your calling. I would just ask you, or or maybe you would ask me if I was experiencing that, have you forgotten who you are? Have you forgotten who you belong to? Are you living for this life or the life to come? Where are your eyes? Are they fixed on you and you and more of you, or are they fixed on Him and His hope? You and I ought to, as Christians, be living with a bullish attitude. That idea that we're confident. You know, like investors will refer to different markets. You have a bear market and a bull market. That came about because they they took that word bullish and applied it to the market. Uh, A bull market is on the rise. It is secure. Investors are confident. The housing market is strong. Everybody's going to make money. It's a great economy. That is the kind of attitude that we should live with no matter what the world's markets are doing because we have a hope that is beyond this world and that hope is rooting, rooted in an effectual call from God. And when the eyes of your heart are open to that reality, suddenly you become very confident no matter what you're facing, not because of you, but because of Him. Do you know where you're heading? Do you know what's on the other side of this life? Think of Colossians 3, 4, where Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, assuming He's your life, is revealed, then we also will be revealed with Him in glory. You know your best life is coming because of the hope of His calling. That calling cannot be stopped or taken from you. And if you know that hope, you should be filled with hope. 
At the same time, the enemy will work overtime to distract you from that hope, to get you all caught up in this world and your situation, your anxieties, your despairs, your discomforts, your wonderings. And he wants you to take your eyes off of the Lord and his hope and put them on something else entirely. It's really the same picture that we see when Peter is walking on water and his eyes are fixed on the Lord and all of a sudden a wave's coming and he looks and fear grips him and he starts to sink. The same thing happens to us all the time when we get our eyes off the Lord. And so Paul, and here today, us, need to be saturating our body, ourselves, our life with this hope. He's praying that they would have their eyes open to it. Number two, we see the riches of his inheritance. Verse 18, the back half, he says, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? At first glance, you see that, and maybe you think, like me, treasure in heaven, streets of gold, a big mansion, right? Everybody wants to live in their mansion in heaven, and heaven's going to be awesome, and And no doubt, we are joint heirs with Christ. The Bible makes that clear. And no doubt, there'll be no more sickness and pain, no more death, no more sorrow. But I want you to read this again slowly. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in in who? In the saints. The question is not what is the inheritance, but who is the inheritance? inheritance. Did you know that? You are an inheritance to Christ, and with Christ you are an inheritor, a co-heir. The passage is speaking to the priceless value that God places on His people. And I, I think we, we do a good job at this church at reminding you all and all of us that we are sinners. I, I think we do a, a, a good job, and we will next week when we get to Ephesians 2. Looking back on how dead we are in our trespasses and sin, but I would propose that we be a little more balanced in the, the sort of conservative, whatever you want to call it, reformedish world, where we do a really good job telling everybody they're a worm in the dirt. You are totally depraved. You can't save yourself. Oh, all your good works, like putting lipstick on a corpse. Your dead men can't raise themselves. How you doing? Oh, just a a totally depraved sinner. (laughs) Unable to save myself. Yes and amen. But once you're a believer, might I propose that we move beyond the idea of total depravity? which is true, and then walk in the grace and confidence of our identity in Christ. Paul wants them to see the riches of his inheritance in the saints because if their eyes were open to that, they would say, I'm redeemed, I've been bought with a price, I'm loved, I'm sought, I'm saved, and I'm set apart for God's purposes. His goodness and his love are pointed towards me. They're on display through his son. I'm part of a divine exchange in heaven. What John 6 describes, all that the father gives me will come to me. You as believers are a love gift from the father to the son. God the father has drawn a people unto himself and given them to his son, Christ Jesus. God has love and affection and intentions for you as a believer. And when you know that and you see it with spiritual eyes, it's a game changer because now you realize your life, no matter who you are, has significance. You're not an accident. You are not living without purpose. God is seeing you. His eyes are never far from you. It's what Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 10. He says, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are more valuable than many sparrows to his people. There's a beautiful inheritance in that. Titus 3, 4 through 7 highlights the goodness of God, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy and by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Spirit whom he poured out on us richly 
Titus 3 says. Richly, you didn't get a little bit of the Holy Spirit. You didn't get almost all the Holy Spirit. Now you got to pray for more and shout out for more and say, God, give me more. I need more. I'm looking for more. No, you have all of the Holy Spirit given richly, poured out over you richly. You have all of Christ. He is your fullness. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Life. When's the last time you meditated on that truth? Who you are in your Father's eyes. I think if we meditate on that reality, our hearts won't fill up with pride like, yeah, I'm special. I think they, they explode with humility because we know exactly who we are. And so when we realize who He is and the affection and the intention He has with us, oh, praise and humility pour out. I think life with purpose, a confidence, a joy, all of that becomes the byproduct because we understand the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. I want that perspective for you as a believer because it's a game changer for the way you live each and every day. And third, Paul highlights the greatness of His power. We have the greatness of His power. He says, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ. And then He highlights that He raised Him from the dead, that's the resurrection, and that He seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, put all things in subjection under His feet, and gave Him His head over all things to the church, which is His body. We have the ascension or the exaltation of Christ. Paul can barely contain himself here. He exhausts as many descriptive words as he possibly can in the Greek language to describe the greatness of God's power. Look at some of them. Surpassing. The word is used in extra-biblical literature to describe a spear thrower who exceeds the throw thrown before him. Surpassing. Greatness is a word that means exceeding excellence. And so you have excellence and then you have exceeding excellence. That's greatness. Power describes strength and force. Strength a word describing intense might, and as if that wasn't all enough, Paul throws in the word might, which is another word just describing strength and power. He wants the church to have an understanding of the kind of power pointed towards the believer and then working through the believer. He aims to do one thing, if nothing else, point every reader to the greatness of God's power. And that gives us confidence Because that's the kind of power that's behind us each and every day when we're living out our faith. And if you think, well, what kind of power is that? Or what does that power look like? Paul tells us when he says these are in accordance with, he's basically saying this power is the same kind of power that God used to do two things. So this is proof that power in your life through God isn't like 1.0 version and then he really dialed it up to raise his son from the dead. It's all the power that God has that he raised his son from the dead with and that he seated them in heavenly places with. That's the power at work within you. He says, and he raised him from the dead, that he raised Christ. Jesus is the only person in human history who has predicted his death and then raised from the dead. Why? Well, because he's truly man and truly God. That's the power at work within you. The power of the resurrection, the same power as the power of the resurrection is at work within you. Joseph Smith couldn't do that. Muhammad couldn't do it. Ron L. Hubbard in Scientology couldn't do it. Buddha couldn't do it. No other gods of any other false religion could ever do it. The power of the resurrection is what sets Christianity apart from every other ideology and world religion. Jesus Christ can offer eternal life because he conquered death on earth. That power is at work within you. And then we have the exalted Christ, not just the raised Christ, not just the resurrection, but the ascension. Again, proof that he is seated at the right hand. What Paul wants to do is, is not put a thought in your head like God is disconnected. Jesus is far away. He's up at the right hand of the Father, and he doesn't have any more time for you. That's not the picture he's painting. What he wants is a, a visual, uh, this symbolism, if you will, or this picture of authority. That's what the right hand of God speaks to, that Jesus is ruling and reigning. He's in control. He is the authority. And that power that 
placed him above everything else is the same power working within you. He says he's seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. No one is there but Christ. No one has power like Christ. And then when he says above all rule, authority, power, dominion, Paul, I believe, is referring to the kingdom of darkness. And the reason for that is he uses those words in the letter of Ephesians to describe spiritual warfare and spiritual entities. Now, Christ is certainly over all rule and authority and power and dominion. You could say he is above the president of the United States, who is said to be the most powerful man in the world. He is above every dictator and every single government leader, yes, and Paul certainly would be including that in Christ's rule. There's no other category that Jesus isn't in control of, but I believe this is referring to spiritual rulers and forces of darkness, because if you look one page over in 3 verse 10, He uses these words again. In order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the, where? Heavenly places. He's speaking of spiritual, heavenly terms. But if you go over again, now Ephesians 6, 12, where he uses these terms again in the same letter, you can see how Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. You just look at how they use the words elsewhere and you get a good idea of what the writer means. He says in verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? The rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in where? In the heavenly places. Paul wants the church to understand the power at work within them is the same power that defeated darkness. Demons cannot defeat you and dominate you and have their way with you. The devil himself cannot defeat you and have his way with you. The world and its darkness, what the Bible says is the God of this world has blinded the minds or the eyes and hearts of unbelievers. Yes, this world is dark for a period of time. It is under the influence of a spirit of the age. Satan, yes. However, for the believer, God's power transcends all of that. That's why we can say that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. He exalted Christ above all of that. That's why we can say, like Romans 8, 31 declares, if God is for us, who can be against us? He is the head of all things. This is why we can be assured that the church wins. Whether we endure persecution whether things get darker and darker, as they clearly are around the world and certainly here in America, the church wins. We could be in a prison cell winning. Why? Because the gospel can't be chained. And the God of this world, lowercase g, has already been defeated. It's a now but not yet promise. It's not a matter of if his kingdom will come. It's just a matter of when. The power that raised him from the dead is the same power at work within the believer and on behalf of the church. But don't miss that last little line there in verse 23. Look at it with me. The fullness of him who fills all in all. How should God's power garner a response from you? Who is Christ? He's the fullness of the church. That word that Paul uses means to fill something up, to complete it. So you could imagine the church ought to say to Christ, you complete us, you fill us, you satisfy us, which begs the question, if you are a believer in this room right now, you need to be taking consistent inventory of your life and asking this question, what fills me? You know, this is perfectly normal and very human to find confidence in a lot of other places, is it not? You you think back to maybe if you've had a high school reunion or how many of you have graduated from college? You got a college degree in here. Yeah, you got a good job and now you're successful in life. Maybe you're a real real go-getter and you didn't even go to college. You built a business and you're one of those people that says, you know, you're a self-made man or woman. That's great. The confidence that you feel or you find heading into those reunions, you know that kind of bravado where you can't wait for people to ask you what? Well, what have you been doing the last 10 years? (laughs) Where do I begin? (laughs) 
assuming that we're not connected on, on LinkedIn, where you'd see several of my publications and a few of the awards, J.D. Power and Associates. <laughs> you're excited and confident. Why? Well, because your satisfaction is in who you are and what you've done. You're not really worried about everything else going on around you because you've got a confidence in, in who you are. You're the man. You're the woman. Might I challenge you and I in this, that if we are as believers finding a, a puffed chest, a growing ego, a pep in our step, because of our successes, of our talents, of our resumes, of our riches, of whatever fills you, that you are walking a dangerous line and even crossing it. For the believer, he is the fullness who fills all in all. So a revelation of his greatness, church, and his power is going to make you a lot smaller in all the right ways and him much greater in all of the right ways. Paul knows it's nothing better for the church than to get a revelation of that. Where you don't have to walk around like you're a worm in the dirt. You don't have to be falsely humble. No, but you know if you had nothing else going for you but Christ was yours, you have that which fills all in all. He is the greatest satisfaction of your life. And so we need to ask, what does the greatness of His power mean for us? I want to give you some practical realities in 2022 and beyond. Kind of the so what, now what idea. Those are good truths. Those are Bible truths. Those ought to be enough for us, most certainly. But if we think of application, so what, now what? Well, you can have power over certain things. You ought to have power over certain things because of the power of God working within you. Not because of you, but because of Him. The first one is you and I, we have power over fear. We have power over fear. In contrast to the fear that this world lives in, if your fullness, your satisfaction is in Christ, well, you're not going to be marked by fear because you know whose power is at work within you no matter what you are facing. I was reading a study the other day. Gen Z is the most fearful generation in all of history because they don't know who to trust. They've grown up in a world that, according to the article here in the study, has been blitzed with every horror imaginable because social media is in the palm of their hand. They were in their formidable years now during COVID hysteria, political upheaval, corrupt politicians, and violent protests. They have difficulty trusting authority, taking risks, and are now even delaying getting their driver's license with alarming numbers. 40% of Gen Z Americans, that's those born in the year 2000 or, or later, do not have their driver's license. And over 48% of, of those 16 to 18-year-olds do not drive at all. You might think, well, that's what's alarming about that. That doesn't have a context. Well, let me give you the numbers for baby boomers. 86% of the 19-year-old baby, boomer, baby boomers in 1983 had a driver's license. So something is happening in Gen Z that makes them not want a car, not want to drive, not want to go anywhere. Studies are showing there's concerns over global warming. They're really scared that all of the, the carbon, whatever it's called, that's coming out of the car <laughs> is ruining the planet and going to kill them all. So they don't want to drive unless it's a Tesla. But a lot of them can't afford Teslas because they don't have that baby boomer work ethic. But that's another sermon for another time. <laughs> They're fearful of everything imaginable that can happen in a car. 
they have general anxiety just in their life that makes them not want to really deal with much. And then they have higher isolation rates due to social media use. They hole away kind of in their room and, and just kind of scroll TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and whatever else they can get their hands on, escaping from the realities of this world. And this is why, beginning in 2010, there is an astronomical spike in junior high girls' suicide rates. Because right around that year was when all the junior high girls were saying, Mommy and Daddy, when do I get my iPhone? When do I get my iPhone? They gave them the iPhone with the best of intentions, perhaps, or just ignorance, and they didn't put parental controls. They didn't have a system or a strategy or a game plan for it. They hadn't read maybe the book Tech Wise Family or one of those books by Tony Ranke that can help you make sense of all this. And they essentially gave their 10 to 12-year-old little girls a device that Satan could use to whisper lies all night long through Instagram saying, you don't look like her, you don't dress like her, you don't have it like her, you don't sing like her, you're not cool like her, you know what, you should just kill yourself, what's the point of your life anyway? Not even realizing it's all fake, it's all Photoshop, and it's all just promoted garbage to get you to stay on the app even longer, not to post and get off, but to stay there and get sucked into the vortex of every next reel because Satan can have his way then pulling a generation into the world. They're gripped by fear and anxiety and insecurity, but if you're a believer, you have power over all of that. You can be confident. You can take risks for the gospel. You can live in light of the gospel. You can tell fear where to go. Psalm 34, 4 through 5, the psalmist declares, I sought the Lord and He answered me, and He delivered me from all my fears. All or some, all. What did he do? He sought the Lord. You want to have power over fear? Seek the Lord. He is where confidence is found. He says, those who look to him are radiant. You know the countenance of a person who isn't fearful? They're radiant. No matter what they're going through, their eyes are fixed on the Lord, and they're so confident in him. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. That's where your confidence is found as well, because God is with you. Who can be against you? And then the psalmist says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Look, fear is a feeling. I would also argue it's a choice. You can feel fear and then still choose to walk forward in confidence. Do you know God's power and greatness? If you do, then compare it to what you're facing and walk confidently in it. Number two, we have power over temptation, church. We have power over temptation in Christ. Now we're all going to struggle with sin. We're all going to be in the fight of our life against sin on this side of heaven. One of the great joys and things that you and I will look forward to, if you say, what are you most looking forward to about heaven? No doubt that Jesus is there. No doubt that it's eternal glory in the presence of God. One of the great things about heaven is no more sin. You tired of it? I am. I don't want any more sin in my life. But for now, what do we do and who do we look to? Hebrews 4.15 says we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us. He's been where we've been. He can sympathize with our weakness. The one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, but without sin is Christ. You know the old leadership principle, you can't take people where you haven't been? Why can Jesus take you into eternal glory, perfect, righteous, and holy? Why is he able to sanctify you day by day, glory unto glory, in this life and on into the next? Why will patterns of sin fade, holiness increase, humility increase, and the light of His life shine in yours because He's been where you are in the throngs of temptation and He beat it. That power is the power behind you as you battle sin. And so we can be confident against it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is such a great reminder of this. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. This is for the person who says, you know, nobody's tempted like me. I'm really weak in this. I mean, no one has it as bad as I do. I just am so tempted. No one understands. Yes, we all do, because we get tempted just like you. And the Bible, the authority of Scripture, through the power of the Spirit, 
says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. It's all common. And Paul is writing to the Corinthians who were very, very, very sinful. God is faithful. He says, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he provides a way of escape also, so you will be able to endure it. When you're walking in the power of Christ, You'll see patterns as you walk towards the trap of temptation. You're going to start seeing patterns of right decision making. Why? Well, because the power of Christ is working within you. The conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and suddenly you go, ah, I see what's going on here. No thanks. I choose righteousness and obedience. And at times you're going to stumble into sin and you fall and succumb to temptation. Well, what does a believer do? Pulls back from that sin and says, Nope, I don't want this. I'm stopping my thought life, my actions, my words, my feet. Nope, I want Christ and his righteousness. That power is at work within you. You don't ever have to say, Well, I just can't defeat this sin. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I, don't, I just can't. I'm just stuck like this forever. No, the power of Christ working in you is going to sanctify you, make you more holy. And just in case you start winning that battle against sin, which many of us do in different ways, particular sins seem to be fading, and then we find more and we think, man, does this ever end? No, not until heaven. It's called sanctification, and the Lord keeps showing you just how wretched you are and I am, and that's a humbling thing because then we know we need Him. But if you get real confident, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 10 says, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So as you grow in victory over temptation, rest assured you can stay humble because another battle is coming. We look to the power of Christ to defeat temptation. And next we have power over defeat. Power over defeat. A believer with a defeatist or or negative attitude all the time is a believer who has forgotten or maybe has never known, and they're not a true believer, all the resources that they have in Christ and the power that saved them in the first place. No trial, no amount of pain, no assault from darkness, and no wrestling with sin will ever mean total defeat for the believer. You have victory. In the end, even on your worst day, your toughest day, times where you're battling sin, times when you feel like the world is winning, you are never defeated because victory is yours. And even if in this life you find yourself losing on many different fronts, if you have Christ, you have and will continue to have victory. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, he writes this, for our momentary, this is so humbling when we go through trials, our momentary light affliction. This is like, They're going through intense persecution. He calls it light affliction. Is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. It's almost like a a harder life here on earth makes you look forward to heaven all the more. You, You talk to wealthy people sometimes and, you know, the ones that maybe aren't believers, they don't have this perspective. You looking forward to heaven? Well, yeah, but I sure would like to see a few of my investments mature, and I got a few projects I want to work on. You know, the believers going, I don't care if I have it all or I don't have it all. This is why Jesus often regarded the poor as more quick to receive the truth of the gospel. Why? Well, they had nothing else to go on. They weren't doing great in this life. Remember the rich young ruler in Luke 18? He walks away sad. Why? Because Jesus says when he goes, hey, I've kept the law. I'm doing pretty good. What do you, you know, what do I need to have eternal life? He goes, oh, one more thing. Just one little part of your heart. I need to have that too. He goes, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the rich young ruler walks away sad. Why? Well, because he just couldn't give it up. The eternal weight of glory wasn't enough for him. He would have considered that loss where you and I, It's victory to have Christ, even if we have to forsake all to have him. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Temporary struggles cannot derail our eternal victory in Christ. There are some people today that I think with the best of intentions are are trying to bring America back under God. And I'm all, all for that. I'd love to see it. But there's a theological viewpoint called theonomy, 
And what theonomists are trying to do, again, with the best of intentions, I believe, is to bring everything under the rule of God. And so Roe v. Wade was overturned, and there is a victory parade. There's a victory march. It's like, here we go, right? America's coming back under God. And I love that. It's noble. We need to remember that at state-by-state state levels, there are still things that can happen. We need to remember that there's still lots of other people, including those in Canada. They're going to open their borders. Abortion's going to still happen, and the fight's not over. But this idea that our victory is in us, bringing everybody under the rule of God, and we're going to do it, that's what's attractive about a theonomy, because we do it. We go out there and fight the fight. And again, with the best of intentions, I still think that it's misguided. Like going out there and yelling at everyone to bring them all under God's rule may work for a while in certain counties in America. But a true theonomy, theologically speaking, would be the whole world coming under the rule of Christ. So I'd love to see the theonomists go beat China. Go win in India. Go after the Hindus. Go get martyred or killed there. Go to places where they hate Christianity, and go visit all of them, and you know what you'll find? That to live in the state of Arizona is a gift from God right now. But friends, our victory is not in bringing the whole world under His rule. He is going to bring the world under His rule. His kingdom is going to come, and that will be the beginning of His total rule. The nations will come to Him for counsel, the prophets declared. That day is coming. So understand this. Your victory and my victory isn't even in the political moments that are coming for us this year and in the years ahead. If the person entering office is the kind of person we want, if there are safe haven states in our country, that still is not the victory and the confidence you ought to have. So we should even ask ourselves, do I find confidence in victory because of some earthly attempt of well-meaning Christians to bring everything under the rule of Christ, or is my victory in Christ, even if I'm in a prison cell, and even if they flip Roe v. Wade back over, and even if we end up like Canada, do we still have victory? Finally, power over death. While unbelievers will rightfully fear death, and they should, the believer knows they have power over it through Christ. This is why Paul the Apostle says in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Because if he's alive and serving Christ, well, all of life is for Christ. If he dies, he is with Christ. And this isn't a morbid wish just to die and kind of get it all over with. It's a view on death that causes us to go all out for the gospel while we are here. Yes, the world is growing darker. Yes, it gets worse before he returns and it gets better. But understand this, we still go all out for the gospel because we know how the storyline ends. It's not a doom and gloom, let's sit around and do nothing. It's a power over death because of Christ. And so we go all out knowing whether you lose your life or you live to be 90 You do it all for the glory of God. This is why we sing, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from your hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. That's why we sing that. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 58 captures the beautiful picture of the believer's confidence in the face of death. I want to read this to close. Paul says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, That's, we'll not all stay dead. We will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised. Imperishable will be changed. We're raised imperishable. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal puts on immortality. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying, It is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Based on the victory of Christ over death, then Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. You can be steadfast because of his power. Be immovable. You can be immovable in your faith because of his power. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You never let your foot off the gas when it comes to God's work here on earth, knowing that your toil is not in vain. It's never a waste. It's never a waste because of the power at work within you. I believe that if you have the eyes of your heart open to those realities, you will experience a change in perspective every day of your life on your way to glory, church. That's what I want for you.